So what did the Italians think about Rommel, both during the war and after the war? Now this is a very interesting question for many reasons, because one major problem with Rommel is that the portrayal from the Germans, the British and also the US side was very biased or slanted in various ways. And additionally, the Italians were rather close to Rommel as well, so they had some more direct experience. Whereas the US and British were far away and the Germans had, well, their own agenda. I mean, I made a video on the various agendas of all the different sides pr during the war. For Germany it was a pre-war and after the war, so how this everything is complicated. And several or many aspects of the, these don't apply to the Italians. Additionally, new sources came up, so the British during the war, they interrogated, of course, the Italians, but they also wiretapped them during while they were captured. And in recent years, many looked at what the German prisoners talked about, and but the Italians were, for mostly, were mostly ignored. So now one Italian scholar looked up what they said about Rommel. Generally, the Italians had also their own myth and agenda and their own bias, which we definitely need to address first. So for them, North Africa was basically a glorious defeat. So the major importance there was that they blamed everything on fascism, but the Italians fight valorously. So the Italian valor versus the bad fascists. So this was their, basically their national myth about North Africa after the Second World War. And additionally, they also had to counter the, the myth basically portrayed by both the Germans and the British that the Italians were the incompetent ally of Rommel. So to a certain degree, the, the view of the Italians is also there to counter to a certain degree what the, the British and also the Germans which portrayed Rommel. So you have this, yeah, as you can see, it gets a bit complicated. So now first uh, I address very shortly the popular view of Rommel basically, and it's only m slightly mentioned on the side. So basically he was seen as one as one the great captain and also arrogant, and basically he was the incarnation of the Teutonic arrogance, what the Italians sometimes viewed. But let's not look now at the more professional side, what the military viewed Rommel as. And there we go for the wartime views and then for the post-war views. Now, for the wartime views, Commando Supremo, the high command of the Italians, already in 1941 had various doubts about his leadership. This was because he was quite insubordinate and they were not getting along. This seems very valid because Rommel is very well known, even in the First World War, to ignore the chain of command, to disregard orders or certain rules. For instance, recently I was at a conference as a guest and the talked about Rommel's actions during the First World War and they noted that he ran into the, the area of the neighboring company with his troops, which is an absolute no-go. And this was rather, became more apparent because after the talk, one colonel, he was all a military historian, argued this, this is absolutely no-go and he was very, very vocal about this issue. For me it was like, okay, he broke the rules, but this is a major issue because if you ran into the area of the other company, friendly fire can occur, various other problems as well. And this continued also into the Second World War. Rommel, as some of you might know, was rather close to Hitler. He was in a cer to certain times in charge of his bodyguards, basically. And you could uh, and basically the command he got for the 7th Panzer Division during the Battle of France in 1940, was to his closeness to Hitler. Additionally, to a certain degree, the Africa Corps as well. And quite often he went directly to Hitler, Hitler and ignored the chain of command of the Germans as well. And he also ignored mostly the Commander Supremo, which officially were his superiors. So as you can see, he mostly ignored the German chain of command and I think he probably completely ignored the Italian chain of command too. So Commander Supremo might have had a point here. Clearly. Now, for the British recordings, it's very important. The recordings were taken usually after the defeat at El, El Alamein or after the fall of Tunis. So one could argue, well, the Italians at this point were rightly in shock or quite in distress because they were shortly after the defeat. Yet, 
the author notes that they are actually in some cases quite lenient or quite balanced, dif different views. And for instance, many blamed actually at this point fascism mo mostly. And also many of the interviewed or many of the, the higher generals were actually pro-German. There were some even argued that directly and said it, well, I'm probably the most pro-German guy here. Now, for junior officers, they were mostly positive about Rommel. So they noted he is an excellent commander. He was close to the troops and sharing the hardship. But uh, some argued also that he was mainly lucky and he had some mad gambles and his, his success was to a certain degree because he was lucky. One colonel was um, very negative about him. He said, yeah, it was basically a reckless action to go for Suez. Whereas others even argued that after El Alamein, he, Rommel lured um, a trap for the British and he would lure them in. So he had some still some card in the backhand or something. So this, this major few points are the magician that can still win and the reckless gambler. So these are basically the extreme points on, on the more junior and senior officers, not the high, high level ones. Now for El Alamein, some argued, well, he had no better alternatives. Others argue, well, he overstretched his supply lines and he focused way too much on tactics. And one very important negative point some brought up was that he banned the 10th Italian core. Now this is very interesting because this is one of the myths of the Italians that Rommel abandoned their 10th core. And actually the core commander itself, himself, stated this is not valid. They couldn't be saved to a certain degree. And if he tried to save them, he would probably lost all his division or way more divisions. This is his argument. So, but this is a fundamental point the Italians brought up against Rommel usually. Now, the retreat following after El Alamein is by many criticized very strongly, although many also point out or generally it's seen as one of a very important and successful retreat. Now, here is a very important point. The Africa Corps retreated out of Libya, which was the most cherished Italian colony and there were Italian settlers there. So they had a stronger emotional view to this than for us it's, oh, it's a piece of desert mainly. Now in March 1943, Rome left and then one can see that they actually start to blame the other generals or blame the other generals even more. What was very interesting then when Rommel was a commander in Italy, that most of the captured Italian generals didn't care about much this anymore. And now what interesting point happens at one point a marshal in Italy takes over the government and the British interrogate the, the Italian commanders and, and they talk with them and they, they basically have this view that they hope that Rommel would take over the charge of the government in Germany, that this is to a certain degree would be a, a wishful thinking or something. And one Italian general basically noted, yeah, that's a nice pipe dream you have there guys, but Rommel it may be a brilliant soldier or something, but he's clearly not a politician. Forget it. He's non-political and he, he can't, I think he even states he can't survive or something. But basically, so okay, n not gonna happen. There's a very interesting point here that they explicitly point out that he's not a politician or an apolitical. In contrast to other German generals, for instance, like Kesslering. So this is also goes in hand with what I talk about, why the Wehrmacht was so effective to a certain degree that the Germans very much focused the generals on being apolitical as much as possible, or at least they thought they could be. It's a very interesting aspect in general here. Now, very important here, when the Italians get interrogated by the British, they are more positive about Rommel and they're more likely to defend him, in contrast to when they're just wiretapped and they don't know that they are basically, they are speaking and somebody is listening. Now for the wartime view of the Italian military, it's basically way more nuanced than that, for instance, from the British side. So they point out the chivalry and the courage, but they also have quite some critique, like the basic point is they see his tactical brilliance, but they contrast it against the Italian Sorbas staff work, which they think is more important. So, so they actually not so keen on his, his tactical achievements, yet in contrast to the 
German side, when, uh, when the Germans usually criticize Rommel, they usually critique his lack of Ostfront experience on the Eastern Front. And the Italians usually don't bring this up. Now, you would argue probably, uh, yeah, I mean, they don't have Ostfront experience neither. But actually, one of the important commanders there, Messi, was um, an important commander on the Ostfront beforehand. So actually, some of the Italian commanders had experience from the Eastern Front, but the, this is usually not brought up about Rommel. And I also see this now sometimes in the comment section that people usually bring up, yeah, Rommel on the Eastern Front had no chance or something along those lines. We can know, we didn't see him fight there, we don't know. And he, he was an experienced commander even during the First World War and uh, in, in, the, in, in the mountain regions. So he probably could have adapted to a certain degree to the Eastern Front as well. Of course, he would probably have been a bit more careful, but we can't know. Anyway, let's now move to the post-war situation. Now, here the point is basically to point out he's a warrior and he's chivalrous, and, but he had some human defects. And he also, there were some memoirs brought up by Rommel, well, not by him, post honestly, which were called War Without Hate. And the Italians basically, to a certain degree, used them to, to put on their own view, like that they blamed the Italian system and the Italian military, but it used it as evidence for the Italian valor. So to a certain degree, they also hijacked Rommel. Yet on the other side, they hijack him, similar to the British, but they are quite skeptical about him. This is the main difference. And the official service history is actually quite negative. So the official service history of the Italian armed forces, they note him as arrogant, reckless, and disoriented, um, that he blamed his allies, so the Italians, and the tactical merits he brought up were insufficient for an army command. So one regular point that is brought up against Rommel is usually that he was a good tactical guy, but he was overrated or not qualified for this high level of command. I mean, this was also brought up by Gerhard Gross, the military historian. Um, he wrote about the Rommel leading his panzer division in France like a company commander. And I pointed out like a company, after company comes a battalion, then comes a regiment, then comes a brigade, and then it comes a division. So to put this in bit in context, we're speaking about 250, 150, 250 men versus 10,000 for a Panzer division around. So yeah, quite a big difference here. They also pointed out that his racism prevented him from utilizing the Italian infantry properly and that his verbal orders were confusing. So German mission command probably was not very well suited with the Italians and that he was a rush and stubborn and everything. Yeah. Not doesn't sound very positive. Note that this is not direct quotes from the official service history. This is uh, in reference of somebody interpreting the service history. Now the Italian commanders in the memoirs were not very favorable from Rommel so the, the praise was limited. So they noted he lost touch with the slow Italian units and a lot of luck. Of course, people can argue with luck. This is I also pointed out in my Ghost Division video that he was quite lucky many times, but Rommel was consistently lucky and also quite successful, First World War and the Second World War to a certain degree, that just putting it to luck is, I think, a bit of an overstretch. But also ignoring the factor is also, and so, so it was not just total tactic brilliance, but it was also not just purely luck. Now, Giuseppe Mancinelli makes a very interesting point. He was at one point a military attaché to, to Berlin, but then was one of the generals. He basically notes pre El Alamein, there was this glorified view of Rommel from the Italians, and post El Alamein, there was basically just a scapegoat. And this is the, both the, between these two extremes. Now, he also noted that Rommel was quite dynamic and, of course, chivalrous because, I don't know, this is the, the, key, the key point, I guess, and that he was torn between Hitler and Germany. Now, he defended then him actually on strategy and logistics. So this is also a very interesting point. Um, a German military historian, Peter Lieb, brings out, he notes that Rommel actually went through a learning period and that he was not so ignorant about logistics. 
and similarly that he changed in various aspects his views on, on many other topics. So there's always this point wh when the critics, when they point out something and when they refer to him. And he also points out the, that, for instance, that a lot of the German generals were quite envious of Rommel, especially of his closeness to Hitler, then that he didn't have a general staff education. And so there's, there's many aspects in there. Again, Rommel is complicated. Now back to Marcinelli. And he noted on the critical side that Rommel was absent sometimes at critical times, which also happened during D-Day, and that he was very reluctant or never admitted his error and was stubborn and rarely changed his decision and ignored usually the opinions of others. This was a very interesting point about Rommel that I mentioned earlier, he ignored often the chain of command but he was very harsh if his subordinates did this. So he took some privilege, you could say, but didn't grant it to others. And one general point Marginelli makes, he, he thinks there's a pattern. Basically, the closer to the front somebody was, the closer was the mutual understanding between the sides. Now, before I do the summary, one important final point. Rommel, unlike Montgomery and Kesselring was not hated by the Italians. So they point out, okay, they might not have really liked him, but they didn't hate him, which is quite in contrast to these other two channels. Now to summarize, the Italians were clearly more critical about Rommel than for instance the British or the Germans for the most part. The praise is very limited and the author of the article I refer mostly notes that the Italian view is actually rather close to the scholarly view we have now of Rommel, which I'm not particularly sure if I agree here from what I read in his article. It appears more negative than the scholarly view to a certain degree. But then again, the problem is with Rommel and the scholarly view is that there's a lot of back and forth. So early on, basically, Rommel was uncritical reception. Then I think it was a very critical reception. And now to this critical reception comes to certainly get a counter-critical reception again. So like Peter Lieb is more, more sometimes he only points out the positive aspects about Rommel again. And, and this is the main problem I also see from myself because I quite often I change the direction of my videos over the years to a certain degree to counter basically at one point the one side and the other side and now I try to basically counter both sides. Because I get comments basically from, from people like completely unreflected, ah, oh, it's so positive, and then there are others that are just negative on, on some topic. And it's like, you are not right and you are also incorrect. It's like, it, guys, let's bring in some nuance, some reflection. And there are some points you can argue, and in some points it's like, yeah, it's just, no, just black and white. Yeah. And so, depending on the exposure from which side you react differently. So I had recently talked with some other people and it was quite interesting and I pointed them out. It seems you only, you only get confronted with these myths, but you know there are myths or oversimplifications on the other side as well. And this is actually the real benefit of this channel because I see stupid comments from all sides and it's quite interesting then to see, okay, so what to bring in. Now, also very interesting was in general to see lately when the professionals talked about Rommel. As mentioned before, I was in a conference about the first world war and there was a, a presentation about what Rommel did in the first world war. And afterwards, the German military historians who most of each know, knew each other as well, they were actually quite a heated debate about Rommel and certain interpretations about his, his part in the military resistance and how he conducted himself on the battlefield and everything around. It was, and it, I, I, saw, I think to a certain degree it was a generational gap as well. So, and there's the generation divide from, from like uncritical, very critical to countercritical. And at one point we'll probably be far enough and say, okay, yeah, well, this was Gavin Rommel, this was the Desert Fox. And our view is more or less this now. And yeah, he had some technical merits, he had some problems with logistics, this and that and forth. And then we can all just 
mainly agree or if we disagree, we don't get very angry or aggravated or something. I hope you learned something new. Big thank you here to my patrons, especially Jack for sending me Krieg in North Africa. Thank you for watching and see you next time.